If you'd like to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. During the time we lived in Searcy, I got to teach a Bible class at Harding Academy uh, every day for quite a while, and then the, the last uh, year we were there, I got to teach one over at the University of Freshman uh, Students on the Life of Christ, and it was a lot of fun to go in every day and just kind of hear their perspectives on things and, and share those stories of Jesus with them, but I will tell you, as interested as I was in all of it, I'm not sure they were always quite as interested as I, as I was. They, they, there were days they were kind of plugged in and connected in class, and other days where they were not so much. And then there were days, not at all like today, mind you, that they would look out the window and see how nice it was outside and just beg me to have class outside. Uh, and especially there in the Bible building at Harding, there is right outside the front doors uh, an amphitheater that they built out there where you uh, have a fountain in front of you and it's just real nice and there's trees around and everything. Uh, and they would love to have class outside. And it was kind of this I just didn't always know what to do because I, I liked it too. I liked it much better than the classroom, but at the same time, the whole time you're sitting there, there's people walk by, people milling around, there's birds flying around, all kinds of things, and just all these distractions, and I thought to myself, what are the chances they're actually going to hang with me through all of this? And so I say all that to say this, this is the traditional site for where the Sermon on the Mount took place. Now, I will tell you, if I'm standing here with the Sea of Galilee behind me, uh, you're, it's got to be a pretty good sermon for you to pay attention to what's going on because there's an awful lot of nature right there with you. And you probably already, as you're thinking about going back out into Oklahoma in January right now, are thinking, I think I'd rather be right there right now. Jesus gets up to preach this sermon and actually kind of the opposite of what we normally think of. He, he gets up there with the crowd and then sits down to teach. Uh, and this is something that the people in his day and time would do when they would do an extended kind of teaching. They would sit and teach and so in Matthew 5, this is the setting that we have. Uh, in Matthew 5, beginning in verse 1, it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to, me, or came, came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and he began by saying, Blessed. Uh, now, blessed is the Greek word makarios, which means not a whole lot to you, but it can be defined in a couple of ways. Uh, the Greek English lexicon says that when it's referring to people, what it means is privileged recipients of divine favor. Now, there are some translations, I think, and a lot of commentators that would like to use the word happy here. And the struggle we have is happy generally doesn't feel like divine favor, does it? Happy feels like everything's kind of going right today. And because of the circumstances that we have, then everything's fine and I feel happy. Blessed goes deeper than that. Blessed is much deeper than the things of the circumstance. Uh, I really appreciate the song Jer uh, Jared just led for us. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth or everything, and all of my worry is vain. That is what the first part of this sermon is about. Uh, it is that we are going to feel blessed regardless of circumstance. Uh, the Zondervan Illustrated Bible background, Backgrounds Commentary puts it this way. It is a state of existence in relationship to God in which a person is blessed from God's perspective, even when he or she doesn't feel happy or isn't presently experiencing good fortune. And if you don't always feel blessed, I imagine at times you may feel the last half of this. You may feel like everything is kind of going against you. Everything's going in the opposite direction. Everything that could go wrong does go wrong. What do we call it? Murphy's Law. Uh, it is all the stuff that could happen one way or the other, the easy way or the difficult way. It all tends to happen the other way. And the world around us would tell us that in those circumstances, you are anything but blessed. And Jesus would say, hang on a second. It is not based on how things are going. It's not based on how easy things are, how wonderful things feel, or how happy you may be. Being blessed is something that goes far beyond that. So as we look at the Beatitudes, I want us to look at them in two groups. Uh, the first four Beatitudes are all about upside-down values, which is to say the world that we live in, the culture we live in, would tell us that when you do these things, these things happen. Okay? When you work hard, you have stuff. Uh, when you're able to push others down, you can rise up. Our value system in our world is completely not the way God designs it. And so in these first four Beatitudes, what we will see is things that are kind of turned upside down. Uh, starting in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, poor in spirit is not terminology we use very often. Uh, I like the, the way D.A. Carson puts it in his commentary on this. Spiritual bankruptcy. 
Uh, and bankruptcy is something, especially in our culture nowadays, we're really familiar with. Uh, we understand the idea of people that are so far over their heads, there is no way out. And so they go and they find a lawyer and they declare bankruptcy. And sometimes there are versions of it where they have to pay back, but they pay at a slower rate and the interest finally stops. Sometimes there are versions of it where it's all forgiven. It tends to follow you around for a while on your credit report and forever on things. You will have to check a question that says, yes or no, have you ever declared bankruptcy? Now, spiritually, this is what Jesus is talking about here. The idea that people who are poor in spirit are people that understand because of what I am doing spiritually, I I'm worthless. I, I cannot do enough. I cannot be good enough. I cannot be right enough. It will never be enough. And that's what the old law was built around, the idea that somehow we could do these things perfectly. And what Jesus understands is you can't. As much as you may want to, you can't. I think of the Bible classes we come to. If you attend Bible class here, how many times have you gone to a Bible class and thought to yourself, you know, if I could just get this stuff right, uh, David was talking about love in 1 John 4 this morning, if I could just get love right in this sense, then how great would I be? But then you get to Bible class the next week and something else comes up and you think, man, if I could just do that, Jesus says, we're never going to be able to do it all right enough. Uh, the way Isaiah puts it in his uh, prophecy is, all these things by, uh, my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. So maybe if you don't want to think of it in terms of spiritual bankruptcy, think of someone who is humble in spirit, someone who is contrite in spirit, and who the word of God, the very thought of it, makes them tremble. I've read, been reading a book over the, the last half of last year called The Gift of Ministry, uh, and each chapter was about three or four pages about something to do with preaching or ministry, and there were several times where the author came back to the idea that you've really got to understand how serious this is, this thing that we're doing. It's not even just that we're reading the Word of God, but I, I get up here to talk to you about the Word of God, and because of that, I have to have this respect for the Word of God, and God calls not just me to that, but all of us to that. When we think of the Word of God and what it means to us, we should tremble at the idea. I don't know what makes you tremble. Uh, there's a long list of irrational things that make me tremble, uh, things I'm afraid of that probably shouldn't matter one way or the other. But the Word of God should be right at the top of that. We, we should be people who tremble, who are contrite in spirit when it comes to the Word of God and to Him. And then he talks about the kingdom of heaven is going to be theirs. And we mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago now that when we see the kingdom of heaven, there are a lot of opinions on exactly what it means, and we can nail down lots of things, but at its core, it's about the sovereignty of God. It's about what the song we just sang is about, that regardless of what it is, we rest in the fact that God is in charge. Uh, and in his class on Matthew a little while back now, as Jeff talked about the book of Matthew, he talked about how this is the church is where this happens. So the kingdom of heaven is where the sovereignty of God is shown, and where the sovereignty of God is shown is in his church. And so the people here who are poor in spirit find a place where there are others who recognize they're poor in spirit, and they're there among them. So blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we understand that so much in the sense of when we have loss. And we talked, I think it was last Wednesday evening, about how sometimes that loss is of loved ones, sometimes that loss may be of position or importance or jobs or any number of things, but there are things that we mourn over. And the thing we desire so much in that is comfort. Now, the world around us would tell us, you just got to just plow through that morning and get back on your feet. Aren't you done with that yet? Isn't that what the world around us would say? And, and you know deep inside, no, this is something that may go on and on, but the comfort that we can have comes from God. And then he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, meek, again, is not a word we use a lot. Uh, the Greek English lexicon says that meek is not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. Now, this flies completely in the face of our culture nowadays, because our culture says you've got to press to be ahead. You've got to put other people down. You've got to rise up above all that, and you've got to let everyone know just how important that you are. And even if they wouldn't say those things out loud, isn't that the stuff that we value? Isn't that what we see all around us? We have a thing in our world today that's an influencer. If you're not online, if you're not on social media, again, you're probably better off than all the rest of us. But there are people on social media that their only purpose is to influence people. And so what you will see is pictures of their perfect lives. 
and all of their clothes just right and their cars just right and the things they do are just so and they have some profound thing to say. And people follow these people online and they watch everything they do and they say, and to me, every time I see that, I, this kind of echoes in my head, self-importance. You're so caught up in self that everyone values what I have to say and wants to hear what I have to say and look at what I do. And in reality, <clears throat> what you're seeing is one version of somebody's life. And so often, we can be guilty of this in church, too, if we're not careful. Don't we get ourselves all put together for church, and here we are, and we have this one side of us that we portray, and then when we leave here, what do we really look like? What do we really live like? That, that's kind of at the core of this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, is to live this out in a way that is real, to live this out in a way that is not your one version of you in front of the religious folks and another version of you in front of everybody else, but you are just who you are when it comes to your relationship with God. So blessed are the meek. Then blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, so they shall be satisfied, for they shall be satisfied. As we read when we started, we won't read it again because we began with it. But the deer pants for water. The deer longs for that. And we want to long for God in that way. So we have this desire for God. And then there is the second half of the group of Beatitudes. And this half, the last four, is all about the sovereignty of God. When God is in control, when we acknowledge that God's in control of our lives and we don't have to control it at the level the world around us would tell us to control it, then we can let go and be the people here in the last half of the Beatitudes. So it begins, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. When God is sovereign in your life, forgiving is natural for you because you don't have to hold power over other people. You don't have to remind them how they have wronged you. You don't have to remind them where they have fallen short. You can extend to them the same kind of mercy you would hope they would extend to you because it is not up to you to be the judge and jury. It is up to God. And then he says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So we want to be people who are people of good character. It's the reason why we're talking about character on Sunday evenings throughout 2022. We want to be people who what you see is what you get. We want to be people who, regardless of who is watching, we act, think, do the same things. And then he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. <clears throat> there is a theme all throughout scripture of peace. All the way back in Isaiah, when we hear the Messiah referred to and prophesied about, he is going to be the prince of peace. And so if we're going to be sons of God, doesn't it just naturally extend that we are going to be people who want to have peace within life? and want to help bring peace to those around us. So in a world that says the way to get the things that you want is violence and war, and quite honestly, as Jesus sits down with this crowd of people to teach, it's a group of people that is looking for an earthly Messiah that's going to overthrow through power and war. And Jesus says right there at the beginning, we, we want to be people who make peace. And I would imagine for a lot of them, their heads are beginning to spin because this is not what they expected. This is not how they thought it would work. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we are blessed. We show the sovereignty of God when we're willing to live sacrificial lives. When we're willing not to make sure we're getting ours, but instead willing to lay ours down on behalf of others. And we live out examples of that, I hope, daily in the way we spend our time, in the way we spend our money, in the things that we do, in our willingness to let other people be above ourselves. It is the way that Jesus will live. And I think you will see that in the Sermon on the Mount, is the things that he talks about, the things that are important to him, are not just things that he says, but this is who he is and how he lives. Theirs is the sovereignty of God. Now, I want you to notice something you may not have noticed before. We have the kingdom of heaven here on the, fr on the front and the end of this, these Beatitudes. And in those two Beatitudes, what you have is the word is. In between, depending on your version of Scripture, what you have is shall be or will be. And so on the bookends, you have present tense. In between, you have the things that are going to be. So when we're showing the sovereignty of God in our lives, these are things that are happening here and now. And the reward for those things, by the way, <clears throat> is here and now. It is God is sovereign in our lives. We have the church surrounding us to help us through these things. And then in between, we find that all those things that we're trying to do, there's going to be a reward that comes for those. It may not be here and now, it may not be in this life, although sometimes that does happen, but the reward that comes for those is going to be in another time and place. 
Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So I don't know about you, but it's one thing to think of blessing when times are difficult or when times are even neutral, when we don't feel happy on the surface. But when we're being persecuted, that, that's a call above. And so what Jesus says here is if we're going to live this life out, we have to have perspective. We have to understand that the persecution we suffer now serves a purpose. The per persecution that we suffer now is going to be completely worthwhile when it comes to the reward that is to come. And even if it is day after day of that, even if our world gets less and less godly, which very likely it will, we can know that the things we deal with here, we're going to have a reward that goes so far beyond in the future. And then even though we don't tie this part usually to the Beatitudes, I feel like this wraps it all together pretty well. In verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a lamp and put it under, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we're doing these things so that others may see. Now, we struggle, I think, at times with how we interpret this. Because oftentimes we tend to do these things when others see. Or, or we tend to do these things because we notice that others are looking and so we're going to do these things. But Jesus said, you're doing these things and because of these things and the way in which you're living, others are going to see. And I truly believe that when you look at these Beatitudes and this, this hinge here about light and salt and all of that and everything that's going to follow, what we find in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount is that living this way is the most evangelistic thing we can do. People write books about church growth, about evangelism, about the right techniques to have, uh, about the programs that will work, all of those things. And even in the church, history of our church, we see that. Uh, the evangelistic way of, of the New Testament was Jesus sent them out two by two, and they went out and they evangelized. Uh, and then Acts comes around, and there are tongues of fire, and they speak in different languages. And 3,000 people, or 3,000 men, are added to the church. And there are all these people, and they keep coming by droves and droves. And then we get into our American time back in the, in the 60s, and we had gospel meetings. And we had these gospel meetings, and we would invite people, and we would door knock, and we would put stuff on their doors and all of that stuff. And we had bus ministries and all of these different things. And there's been program after program after program. And what they tend to do, like anything else in life, is they run their course. And you could probably remember that in all aspects of life that are not church things. Something has been a big deal at one point or another, and then you kind of forget about what that thing was. I saw a post online the other day of nostalgic things that you had when you were growing up that you just thought was the best thing in the world, and no one even remembers who, what it is now. Uh, one of the things in the midst of that was the viewfinder. Anybody remember the viewfinder? Uh, the viewfinder, when I was a kid, was this little disc, and it had little. It was like a mini slide projector. Uh, anybody remember slide projectors? Uh, we had viewfinders, and they were this little. And the light would shine through. You would put it up to your face, and you would click through the pictures of whatever it was. You would get them places when you would go travel. You might get them about some place you would like to go. There was a restaurant where I grew up that that was their dessert menu. It was on a viewfinder, and you would go through and look at the dessert things. If I were to put a viewfinder in the hands of a kid nowadays, they would look at that and say, what is this? They might eventually figure out there are two places that look like eye places, and I'll put them up. But then you'd have to explain to them where to push to get the light and all of that. I have watched videos of kids handed rotary phones and said, make a call. And they look at it and look at the adults and they're, what in the world do I do here? I will tell you, whatever evangelistic thing comes and goes, this one will remain. If you live this light out, the words of Jesus tell us that people are going to see it. That this kind of life is designed to be one that is lived completely out in the open. It is not a life that was designed to be lived when you walk through these doors and then left here on the pews when you walk back out the doors. This is how we tell people about Jesus. Now, I understand we need scripture. I, I understand we need to understand uh, how salvation comes about. I understand we need to know all of those things, and we need to have our Bibles and read them and be versed in it. I get all of that. But if we are not living this out, then those things do not do what they may do otherwise. When people see this in our lives, they want to know more about that. 
So he says to let your light shine. And and our question this morning is, are are we letting our light shine? Are, Are we people who are living this kind of life, not just because it's the right thing to do, although it is, not just because it's what Jesus taught, although it is, but because when we do this, people will want to know more about him. And ultimately, is that not what we want? All of these blessings that we read about in the first part of Matthew 5, do we not want those in the world around us to experience those same blessings? And if we do, this is the way to help get them there. So this morning, if you look at your life and you think, you know, I just really don't feel all that blessed. I feel like things are not going in the way I'd like them to go at all. Know that the God who created all of this is still sovereign over it. Know that that God, even when things are up or things are down, is still a God who loves you and wants you to feel the blessing that he has given to you. He has given us a blessing sometimes that lives its way out here on earth and more often lives itself out in heaven in the life that is to come. And if you would like to experience that blessing, you can be baptized into his son this morning and you can walk along this walk of the sermon that he preaches, living this out in your life. Or if you have allowed this to fade in the past for you, you can regain that again today. You can pray to confess and repent and come back to him. If there's some way we can help you as your church family, please come while we stand and sing.